Controlling traffic in and out of your Azure networks will be an important aspect of Exam 70-534. You're going to need to have a good understanding of how to route traffic with both network security groups and user-defined routes. So let's dig in. In this lesson, we'll describe how to use user-defined routes in network security groups. We'll learn when they're used and the kinds of issues they address. User-defined routes are basically a way for you to override the default inter-network communication that Azure wires up for you automatically. For example, every time you create a subnet with two or more VMs in it, Azure automatically creates routing rules for those network resources. There's a local virtual network rule that allows direct virtual machine to virtual machine communication within a subnet. No intermediary hop is taken. If this virtual network is part of a site-to-site -site virtual private network, then a rule is automatically created that says all traffic to and from your on-premises network should be hopped through the VPN gateway. And if your virtual network is public facing, there's a rule that indicates traffic between the VNet and internet should be routed through either the application gateway or load balancer, whichever is controlling internet traffic for that subnet. But this doesn't always work for every deployment. It may be that within a given VNet, you need to route traffic through a custom firewall or other appliance. Or you may have a special protocol that needs interpretation before being handed off to the next network zone. User-defined routes allow you to redirect your network traffic between network boundaries, ensuring your traffic is handled by the device or network that needs to handle it. Let's consider this example from Microsoft. Here, we have a two-tier application in the same virtual network. Start by looking at the bottom two white squares, each of which represents a subnet. The front end subnet has two virtual machines that work as web servers. The back end subnet has two virtual machines that work as database servers. Each of these subnets are part of a network security group, which is enforcing network routing permissions for that subnet. This is a pretty standard architecture for a highly available multi-tier application. The only concern is, while this layout is secure, it could use the additional benefit of a firewall inspecting the traffic between the subnets. Now look at the large white square above, where the VM named FW1 is located. This is a virtual machine acting as a firewall. It's in its own subnet and contains only the firewall VM. In this layout, all network traffic between the front end and back end subnets will be routed through this firewall network appliance using user-defined routes. The default routing scheme from Azure would peer each of these subnets, meaning traffic would not, by default, Wrote from the front-end subnet to the firewall, then to the back-end subnet with the response in reverse order. To accomplish that network flow, we need to use a user-defined route to send packets directly to the network appliance VM. You'll probably see questions in exam 70-534 about how to go about creating a user-defined route. Generally speaking, you start by creating the hop you want to insert, be that an appliance virtual machine, a gateway, a network, or a subnet. Then you affix a static private IP address to that hop so it can be assigned as the next hop. Now you can create a user-defined route. The route indicates the CIDR range, or address prefixes in other lingo, that should be directed through this user-defined route, the type of hop the traffic will be, and the IP address of the hop. Note that whenever IP address you provide to the hop has to be reachable from the network boundary taking on the UDR. In other words, if I have a subnet with an access control list rule that does not allow for outbound internet traffic, and I try to assign this UDR an internet hop type, then that UDR will be invalid. Finally, I assign the user-defined route, which is also called a route table, to the subnet. So, what are the kinds of middlemen I can institute with a user-defined route? I can specify another virtual network or subnet as my next hop. I can also specify the VPN gateway if I'm working with a site-to-site -site VPN connection. I can work with the internet gateway that's part of my virtual network or a virtual machine that I create as a network appliance. Note that if I'm going to use a VM as a network appliance, I must enable IP forwarding on that virtual machine's network interface. Alternatively, I can create a black hole which will swallow up all the packets routed to it.
This is useful if you want to cease all outbound traffic from a selected subnet, but cannot silence the network traffic of virtual machines within that subnet. An example of this might be a VM hosting software that continuously probes against some external resource, such as an auto-suggest service, which you can't shut off from within the VM itself. User-defined routes are appropriate for any time you want or need to insert a layer of security between network boundaries or if you need to direct traffic differently across a network boundary. For example, you may want to force your hybrid virtual network to route all traffic through your on-premises network so that both on-prem and Azure resources share the same outbound IP address and firewall rules. Or, as in our earlier example, you might want to install an intermediary network appliance, such as a firewall, between network boundaries. Or you may have a load balancing need that's more sophisticated than the rules available for an Azure load balancer, and you want to roll your own. Or perhaps you're using a specialized protocol that needs to be translated by a middleman before it's sent to the next tier of an application. All of those ends can be accommodated with user-defined routes. In Azure, you control network access to an endpoint, be it a virtual machine or a subnet, via an access control list rule. When I group these individual access control list rules together to create a comprehensive and priority-based approach, it's called a network security group. In the Azure Resource Manager deployment model, network security groups are the primary means of controlling network access. Each network security group is assigned to a subnet or, occasionally, a virtual machine. Each subnet or virtual machine can only have one network security group assigned to it by default. But a virtual machine that is inside a subnet with a network security group can have its own VM-specific child network security group. That said, if I have a virtual machine that has an access control list assigned to it already, I can't assign a network security group to that VM. Probably the best thing to do in that case is to combine the ACL into my network security group, remove the access control list from my virtual machine, then assign my newly updated network security group to the VM. Network security groups work at layer 4, the transport layer. Therefore, you could specify rules that apply to TCP, UDP, or both. When you specify both TCP and UDP, you are also including support for the ICMP protocol. It's going to be important to understand the decision tree used to process network security group rules. We'll look at a diagram in a moment, but before we do, let's go over how the tree is branched. First, Azure considers the direction of the request. It retrieves a subset of the network security group rules relevant to whether this is an inbound or outbound request. Next, it goes through the rules in order of priority. Each rule is tested to see if it's a match for source and destination IP addresses, ports, and protocol. As soon as Azure sees a match, it either allows or denies the traffic based on what the matching rule says to do. Azure then stops processing rules. It's really super important to remember this. Rules are processed in ascending order, and processing stops as soon as a match is found. Thus, the lower the rule number, the more likely it is to be applied. So, a rule with priority 100 is tested first and applied if relevant. If it isn't, then the rule with priority 200 is tested and applied if relevant. And so on. All rules in a network security group must have a unique priority number. Let's look at a flow chart. First, Azure receives the network traffic. Based on whether the traffic is inbound or outbound, Azure retrieves the relevant rules, which are sorted by priority in ascending order. The lowest number priority rule is applied first. If the rule does not match, then Azure gets the next rule and tests it. This loop continues until there are no more rules to process or a rule matches on the basis of source and destination IP imports plus protocol. Once that match is made, Azure discards the traffic if the rule is to deny and sends along the packet if the rule is to allow. This becomes a little easier to see in action when we look at the default network security group rules. By default, there are three inbound rules in every network security group. 
The very first rule specifically allows all VNet to VNet communication on all ports and protocols. The second rule allows the Azure load balancer for this solution to speak to all internal resources it can address. The third and final rule denies traffic from any other source. The default outbound network security group rules are basically the same thing. The first rule allows VNet to VNet communication. The second rule allows all assets within this network security group to communicate with the internet. The third and last rule bans all other traffic. In the previous two slides, you saw the use of network security group tags. These are basically a means of specifying site or ranges without actually having to know them, which is helpful since in some cases it's not easy to know the range represented by these tags. The tags are virtual network, which represents the addresses of any and all VNets in Azure, as well as your on-premises network ranges if you have a hybrid network. Azure Load Balancer, which is the IP address of whatever service is handling your health probes. Usually that's an Azure Load Balancer or an application gateway. And Internet. That's any publicly reachable IP address that's outside your virtual network. Usually it's some third-party location or service, but it can also be publicly addressable Azure services that are outside your virtual network, such as an Azure Web App. Okay, let's look at some examples of routing priority. In this example, I'm going to create a blacklist of two IP addresses. That is, all inbound IP address traffic is going to be allowed to the resource secured by this network security group, but these two addresses are going to be denied any access. Remember, rules are processed by priority. The lower the priority, the sooner it's processed, and each rule in a group must have a unique priority. I have set a priority of 1000 for the first band IP address. I've set a priority of 1010 on the second band IP address. And I have set a priority of 2000 on the rule that allows all other inbound traffic. Thus, when an inbound request is received, Azure will first check to see if the source of that request is 100.100.100.1. If not, it will check to see if the source of the request is 100.100.100.2. If not, the traffic will be allowed. Let's suppose the request is coming from 100.100.100.1. In that case, the very first rule says no, that IP address is denied access. So Azure terminates the connection and stops processing any further rules. Now let's look at a whitelist. That is, all traffic is going to be denied except traffic from the specified IP addresses. In this case, Azure will first look to see if the source IP address is 100.100.100.1. If it isn't, Azure next looks to see if the requesting IP address is 100.100.100.2. If it is, the access is allowed. If it isn't, Azure denies the connection. So, the processing order is the same, and the rules are very similar, but the outcome is different. What matters most is the order in which the rules are processed. Here's that same whitelisting network security group, only this time with a third rule that has an incorrect priority. You can see my intent is to allow 100.100.100.3 to access this resource, but it has a priority of 2010 which is higher than the rule that denies all inbound access to the resource. So, if a request originating from 100.100.100.3 is made to the resource protected by this network security group, Azure will first look to see if the source IP address is 100.100.100.1. Since it is not, Azure next looks to see if the source IP address is 100.100.100.2. Since it is not, Azure then goes to the rule that denies all inbound traffic and terminates the session. In other words, we never get to the rule with priority 2010 because the rule with priority 2000 was satisfied and Azure stops processing network security group rules as soon as it finds a match. And here's one way to correct the network security group rules to allow access to source IP address 100.100.100.3. I delete the badly prioritized rule, which fell after my deny all rule, and I apply a classless interdomain routing range, or CIDR range, to the second rule, 
that covers both 100.100.100.2 and 100.100.100.3. By the way, being able to understand CIDR notation is going to be an immense help for exam 70-534. So, if you're not familiar with how CIDR notation works, bone up. So, when is it appropriate to use network security groups? Pretty much any time you're dealing with a virtual network or a virtual machine. Generally speaking, you want to protect any network service against unwanted or unexpected traffic. Pessimistic routing, rules that state traffic which isn't specifically allowed is banned, is usually safe routing. Also, network security groups allow you to have very granular control over access at the transport layer. That frees up a lot of time you might otherwise spend applying policies within an individual machine's firewall or through other routing tools. That's it for this lesson. When you're ready, go ahead and complete this section and we'll move on to the demo.